All right, in this hopefully brief video, we're going to be talking about DNA from chapter 10 in the microbiology textbook. Um, this chapter is just about the basic chemistry and the history behind how we've come to know what we know about DNA. We're going to start with how do we know what DNA actually does, and the shoulders that we stand on here are essentially beetle and tatums. They came up with what was at the time called the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis, and they got there by working with red bread mold or Neurosporocrasa. Um, now that mold could normally grow on a minimal medium, which means you could put the barest medium on there and that mold would grow in it. It's a pretty hardy little mold. Um, they would then take that mold and they would irradiate it with x-rays. Now we know that x-rays are mutagenic. That means it damages the DNA. Once they hit the mold with x-rays, what they would find was some of the strains of the mold could no longer grow on minimal medium. So they took that mold that couldn't grow on the minimal media, but it could on a complete medium that had everything in it that it could possibly need to survive. And then they started to put it in essentially minimal medium plus one amino acid. So this is minimal plus alanine, minimal plus threonine, and so on. So these are individual amino acids. And what they found is this particular strain that they had hit with x-rays, it could no longer make arginine, which is one of the 20 amino acids. That means when they hit it with x-rays, they broke the mold so that where it used to be able to make arginine, it could not anymore. So we know that you need enzymes in order to be able to make the products inside of your cells. So they said, well, we broke the enzyme necessary to make arginine inside of this mold. Therefore, genes must code for enzymes. And that's how they got to the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. Okay. Well, we've had, let's see, that was in 1941, I think it was. And so we've had, oh my gosh, 60 something years. Um, since Beetle and Tatum. We've come a long way since Beetle and Tatum. And we now know that genes do not just code for enzymes. Um, when I was taught this, it was the one gene, one polypeptide hypothesis. Um, now it's not even that. It is they code for specific products. So genes can code for polypeptides, which are strings of amino acids. Um, genes can also code for specific RNA products like mRNA, tRNA, rRNA, small nuclear RNA, whatever. They can code for a bunch of those different things as well. So they don't just code for proteins. They can also code for specific nucleic acid products as well. Um, since I was taught the one gene, one polypeptide hypothesis, that's still what I'm kind of giving y'all, but just know they don't just code for proteins or polypeptides. They code for more than that. Okay. The next section of your textbook starts to talk about how did we learn that DNA even was the genetic material? Um, back in the 1920s, we had made it to the point in the debate where it was either proteins that were your genetic information or it was DNA. Most biologists thought it was protein because proteins are so much more complex than DNA. I mean, there's 20 different amino acids. Your proteins can be thousands of amino acids long. They are just way more complex, not to mention there are so many different proteins that exist in your body. And so just intuitively, it seemed like proteins were going to be your genetic information. But um, nucleic acids on the flip side, they only have four nucleotides that make up DNA. And so they seem so simple that it couldn't possibly be the genetic information. It's just too simple a molecule. Well, uh, Frederick Griffith, back in the 1920s, started to work with Streptococcus pneumoniae, which, as the name implies, it is um, a streptococcal species that does tend to cause pneumonia. Um, it comes in two forms, a rough form, which under the microscope, the cells look like wrinkly or rough, and then a smooth form. Now, the smooth form is smooth because it has a capsule. If you remember anything about the capsule from previous chapters, it's an additional layer that bacteria have that can help them evade your immune system. So the smooth strain is pathogenic because the cells can evade your immune system. The rough strain, on the other hand, your immune system can grab them and murder them, no problem. So the rough strain, not pathogenic. Well, what Frederick Griffith did is he would take these strains and then heat kill them and then try to figure out if they could still kill mice because mice can be killed by strep pneumonia just like humans can if they aren't treated. So rough strain, 
not a problem. It's not pathogenic in mice, just like it's not pathogenic in people. Um, heat killed smooth strain. So basically we would take it, we would put it in an autoclave. Since it's dead, that can't kill the mouse. But if we took the rough strain and a dead smooth strain, something passed between the rough strain and the heat killed smooth strain that allowed the rough strain to then kill the mouse. So essentially something was transforming the rough strain that used to not be pathogenic and it was making it pathogenic. So it was transforming into a pathogenic organism. Something about this dead thing was making this pathogenic. He called it the transformative principle. Um, he didn't know what it was about this dead smooth strain that was transforming this rough strain, but there was something in it that could pass and then turn the rough strain into a pathogenic strain that could still kill them. Again, he thought it was going to be a protein because those are so much more complex, but he knew there was something that could pass through them and it was something that was part of the cell that didn't require a living cell in order to get there. Okay, next we get to Avery, McCarty, and McLeod. They worked off of Griffith's experiment, so they were still doing the rough strain, the smooth strains, and they're still working with strep pneumonia. So same stuff. These guys were working with that same transformative principle, but they were trying to get to the bottom of what exactly was being transferred from the dead smooth strain to the rough strain to transform the rough strain into a pathogen when it didn't used to be a pathogen. So it's a brilliant experiment and I really want to explain it to you. So here's what's going down. They used enzymes that could specifically break down various molecules. So proteases break down proteins ribonucleases break down RNA, and deoxyribonucleases break down DNA. The control did not get any enzymes. They mixed together their heat-killed smooth organism with the rough organism, and then they mixed them with those enzymes. So this one killed all the proteins. Um, this one killed all the RNA. This one killed all the DNA. So depending on what was actually being passed from the smooth strain to the rough strain, we were gonna be able to tell what actually transformed the organism. And so control organism, smooth, still present, we still transformed. And so that was exactly as it was supposed to be. Everything worked like it was supposed to. When we killed the proteins, we still transformed smooth into rough. So it was not a protein that was the transforming agent. Ribonucleases, smooth strain was still present. So it is not RNA that is the transforming principle, but when they used the deoxyribonucleases, nothing passed. And so the rough strain was not pathogenic. And so this right here is what proved DNA was the transforming agent or transforming principle. So essentially this is a the first little chunk of evidence that DNA is the genetic information right here. Okay, next up we have Hershey and Chase. These are the guys that put the nail in the coffin that proteins are not the genetic information. So they worked with phages. Phages are viruses that can infect bacteria and they are made of literally two things, protein and DNA, and that is it. So there were no complicating factors here. That's the thing about bacteria. If there's so many chemicals in bacteria, there were people that were doubting Avery, McCarty, and Cloud, McLeod's experiment. And so Hershey and Chase were like, yeah, well, you can't doubt whatever our results are because these viruses are just made of two things. So this is going to definitely prove one way or the other. So they radio labeled some phosphorus. Phosphorus is present in DNA, but not in protein. They radio labeled some sulfur. Sulfur is present in protein, but not in DNA. They then would mix the phage in with bacteria to find out whether the phage could infect the bacteria. When it was the radiolabeled phosphorus, the radiolabeled phosphorus made it into the bacterial cell. They could detect the radioactivity in the bacteria and the bacteria got infected. And so this shows the DNA got in, the virus was, enable, uh, was able to infect. With the protein, 
here's what it showed. The protein did not even enter the bacterial cell. The virus did infect, but there was no radioactivity within the bacterial cell. Therefore, the protein was not what caused the infection or transformed the bacteria. It had to have been the DNA. So again, Hershey and Chase credited with putting that nail in the coffin. Protein cannot be the genetic information. It has to be DNA. All right, from there in the rest of the chapter, it's let's get to know the chemical structure of each of these guys. This is all stuff that you honestly should have had in your freshman biology classes. Just make sure you remember it and you remember the details pretty well. Um, remember that there's a bunch of videos online that can really help you out with this. So this is the basic structure of a nucleotide. Both of your nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, are made out of nucleotides. The difference in the nucleotide between DNA and RNA is all about the sugar. And ribose, um, in ribose, in RNA, it's ribose. In DNA, it's deoxyribose. But aside from that, they both have the same phosphate group, which notice phosphate's negatively charged. That's why both nucleic acids have a negative charge. The nitrogen-containing base or nitrogenous base, that's where you have your A's, G's, T's, C's, or U's. Um, there's a little bit of difference in that too between your DNA and your RNA, but aside from that, they're both made out of the nucleotide structures. Now, both DNA and RNA are made out of the nucleotides strung together to make something called a polynucleotide. DNA is two polynucleotides put together. RNA is just one, but that one strand can end up folding back on itself, so there can still be double-stranded sections of an RNA molecule. Um, but notice there's one nucleotide, there's another. Um, the book does mention phosphodiester bonds, so there's a phosphate with two bonds attaching it to two different nucleotides, so there's your phosphodiester bond right there. Um, it mentions the five prime and three prime end. It's not labeled here, but you should still be able to figure out which is which. So remember, the number one carbon is attached to the nitrogen-containing base, so there's carbon one, two, three. That means this is the three prime end four and then five so this is the five prime end so this would be labeled five prime this would be labeled three prime um let's see so since this is just one strand there's no complementary base pairing in one strand the only time you can ever get complementary base pairing is when there's two strands side by side okay um your chargoff example Let's go ahead and run through this to make sure that you guys can do it. Let me turn my little pen on and see if I can find my pen on my desk. So, the new species is discovered that has 28% adenine. What is the percentage of all the other bases? So, here's what you got to remember. Chargoff is basically the one who started to understand what base pairing essentially meant. But he did that by recognizing the he was seeing chemical percentages that were the same between A and T and the same between G and C. So there were always going to be relatively equal amounts of A and T and relatively equal amounts of G and C. And we now know that that's because of complementary base pairing. So if there's 28% adenine, that means there's going to be 28% thymine. And so there's 28% thymine. So 28 and 28, that gives us 56% made up by the A's and the T's. That means we have 44% left over that is made up of the G's and C's. 44 divided by 2 is 22, so that means we have 22% G and we have 22% C. So hopefully you guys got that. After that, I told you I didn't really love the pictures that are in your textbook, so I pulled this one from a genetics textbook. Um, I want you guys to get the here it is, key feature stuff. So two strands form the double helix. So there's one strand, there's two. It twists, there's the helix part. Um, the bases and opposite strands do the complementary base pairing thing. So if there's a G on one strand, there's going to be a C on the other. If there's an A on one strand, there's going to be a T on the other. Um, the two strands are anti-parallel with regard to their five prime and three prime directionality. So what that means is if this one goes three prime to five prime in the upward direction, this one is going to go three prime to five prime in the downward direction. And there are about 10 nucleotides in each strand per complete 360 degree turn 
of the helix. All right, then you got these notes off over on the side. So since we have two strands side by side, first off, remember your super duper basics. When you have straight lines connecting things, that's a covalent bond. So a polynucleotide is made with covalent bonds. Those red lines that I just drew on there, those are your phosphodiester bonds. And remember that's your phosphate being held with two different bonds to two different sugars. Then the hydrogen bonds are represented with these dotted lines. So the complementary base pairs, they are just hydrogen bonded to each other. That's going to be relevant for us as we start to talk about DNA replication, transcription, replication forks, all of those types of things. And so each polynucleotide covalently bonded, very strong. But when you start to put them both together, they're hydrogen bonded to each other. That means they're not really held together all that strongly. Okay. From there, just your really basic chromosome structure. Remember that prokaryotes usually just have one single circular chromosome, while eukaryotes tend to have a bunch of linear chromosomes present inside their cell. Remember, there's a locational difference. Eukaryotes keep ours inside of the nucleus, where prokaryotes just kind of throw theirs in the middle in that nucleoid region. Um, it is very, like your book mentions that chromosomes tend to have a, about a thousand genes on them. That totally varies depending on how big a chromosome is going to be. Um, but yeah, kind of on average, it's about a thousand. For human beings, it's very different in different things. So I don't really want you to know a number of genes. I do just want you to know there's lots of genes on a chromosome, essentially. The book doesn't really have a good picture for showing you DNA packaging within eukaryotic chromosomes, and so I did want to go over this one with you as well. So the first picture, got to find my thing again. You always see this picture of the double helix, but this is never what the DNA actually looks like inside your cells. That molecule is so fragile, even though, yes, covalent bonds are very strong. It is such a long molecule, and there are so many moving components to your cell that molecule would be torn apart by shearing forces so quickly. And so we can't just let that float around as is. So in our cells, what we do is we wrap the double helix around these little histone proteins to create little bubbles that I like to call, well, everybody likes to call, nucleosomes. So there's a nucleosome, there's a nucleosome. The little pill-looking thing that it's wrapped around, that's the histone. Then the nucleosomes get stacked together to make this structure which I don't love how they spelled it. There should not be an E on the end of it, but that's what chromatin looks like. Chromatin is still loose DNA. It's still usable DNA. It is still so thin that with our light microscopes that we use in our lab, you would not see that under the microscope, especially because in a eukaryotic cell, there's gonna be a nuclear envelope around it, so you wouldn't be able to see it because the envelope would be in the way. But that's still, like I said, usable DNA. This is DNA that's being transcribed, translated. You're expressing the genes present on chromatin. When we are carrying out portions of the cell cycle, like in mitosis and meiosis, where we're going to supercoil or condense the DNA into chromosomes, what happens then is we fold the chromatin back on itself, like in this picture, and then the folds, we loop them like an old school telephone cord. And then this is what is called supercoiling. Supercoiling is what creates actual chromosomes. Chromosomes are thick enough that you can see those under our light microscopes. And so if you remember looking at mitosis or meiosis under the microscope, you could see the chromosomes with the spindle attached to them. It's been packaged up so much that the molecule is big enough that you can actually see it now. So that's the difference between chromatin and chromosomes. Okay. The last thing that I wanted to give you guys in this video, viral genomes, your book mentions most of the stuff that I wanted you guys to get, but your book did not mention positive versus negative sense strands. Um, sometimes viruses like to give a negative sense strand to your cell which means your cell will not have the enzymes directly necessary to read a negative sense strand. The virus has to come with an enzyme to copy a negative sense strand into a positive sense strand, and then your cell can read positive sense strands and do whatever it needs to do. So there's different types of genetic information found inside viral genomes not just DNA or RNA like what you guys have inside of your cells, 
but also the positive versus the negative that has to be read slightly differently inside of your cells and has an impact on how fast viruses can change, which, I mean, we've been in the COVID pandemic at this point for three years and you, we are up to Omicron, God, uh, like BA2, I think, subvariants at this point. And that's just because it's one of those viruses that can evolve very, very fast. And so that kind of comes into this sort of stuff. I hope that under, helps you understand this chapter just a little bit more and good luck with the rest of it. If you have any questions, as always, please feel free to